so far, uh, we've invested a lot of time looking at sampling methods that, if implemented properly, will give us valid results. Now, in this lecture, we're going to go in the opposite direction and look at methods that are somehow flawed. Because it's just as important to know what things you shouldn't do as it is to know what things you should. So we actually already discussed this one in the context of valid methods. And it's a good place to start this discussion since it, it rides the line between valid and invalid. It, its results are often questionable, but there are times when it's the only option available and you can still get reasonable results with it. The second scenario, for example, is a convenient sample since there's no attempt being made to randomize the selection process. However, it's still possible to get accurate results from it, so you don't have to worry about variety in the population like you would in the first scenario. In that situation, if you were sampling from a primarily conservative neighborhood, you would expect the customers of any local business to be less representative of other groups. Now, when researchers are creating polls or, or surveys, they put an enormous amount of effort into the way questions are phrased. For example, when asking if people favor or oppose a proposal, they'll alternate between favor or oppose and oppose or favor to minimize the tendency to favor the first alternative in a list. In a push poll, like you see in this scenario, the researchers do the exact opposite. The first sentence intentionally tries to bias the responder by framing the chairman as having ethics issues. Cherry picking is a scenario where the researcher intentionally tries to bias the results by only selecting data that supports their desired conclusion. Now, in this scenario, you would expect people to patronize businesses closer to their homes. So by limiting the survey, to people near a given store, it's more likely that people will only have experience with that particular location. Now, in any survey, respondents have the option to participate or not. In a well-constructed survey, the researcher will take that into account and work to make sure their final sample is still representative of the population. In a self-selecting sample, all respondents are treated equally. So in this situation, you're more likely to see respondents who feel strongly about the topic. And this can create a situation where a small but a highly vocal minority can have a disproportionate impact on the results. Now, I actually have direct experience with this particular kind of poll. The student surveys done at the end of most online classes don't require the students in the class to respond. And as a result, the response rates are often very low, which can allow even a single disgruntled student to heavily skew the results. So in the next several lectures, the last ones in this chapter, we're going to continue our discussion of sampling methods by looking at some of the ways that bias can be introduced into results, sometimes accidentally, uh, so that the final results end up being skewed.